Today we will be using the Bamboo Lab P1P to print one of the toughest materials, but in order to do so, we're going to need to upgrade it. So I'm going to be adding an enclosure today, a filament drying system, as well as do some hardware upgrades. I've got good news. The filament was just delivered, so I'm going to go and pick it up. So what's so special about nylon? Well, let's go over the data. In terms of strength, nylon sits rather below average. And in terms of stiffness, we can see that it underperforms there too. So what's the catch? Its toughness is far superior to other filaments. But there's something else that makes nylon stand out compared to other materials. It's got a low coefficient of friction, which makes it slippery smooth. A lot of nylon clothing feels silky smooth for this reason. This low friction and high toughness makes it an extremely wear resistant and long lasting material. Perfect for mechanical parts like bearings, gears and sliders which we will be using in future videos. The cherry on the cake is that nylon is really cheap. It so happens to be one of the most affordable materials in industry which is why it's so widely used. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Because nylon isn't just mechanically tough, it's also really tough to 3D print. And this is where we will have to start modifying the printer. So why is nylon so tough to 3D print? There's three main reasons, and the first one is warping. Like ABS and ASA, it's got a really high coefficient of thermal expansion, meaning that as we heat this filament up, it will expand significantly. And as it cools down, it will shrink significantly. The heated bed on any 3D printer will keep those bottom layers gooey and stuck to the bed because of that higher temperature. However, as we move farther away from the bed, those layers won't be heated as much. Instead, the colder air will cool the upper layers of the print. As the top layers cool rapidly, they will shrink, so much so that the gooey bottom layers will be pulled up. This uneven cooling is what causes part warping. So what can we do to stop the air from cooling those layers? Well, one solution is we can heat the air. Luckily, we can use the bed as our heat source, so all we have to do is trap the air into a chamber and it will heat up. But there's another problem. You see, when you solve a problem, you almost always create another problem. If the air inside the chamber gets too hot, it can potentially turn into a pizza oven. So we need fans. I need fans, so please subscribe. But the printer also needs fans to regulate its temperature. Two on the back with an added carbon air filter. We will also need a cable chain to keep the wires inside the enclosure. But first we'll be upgrading the hot end and extruder gears to be able to resist abrasive filaments like nylon carbon fiber. The new extruder gears and hot end are made of hardened steel. This more robust material will wear less as the filament passes through, which increases the lifetime of these parts. Now to the assembly. First I take off the housing and unplug all the wires, which will reveal three M3 screws. Once they are loosened, we can remove the tool head assembly. I've got quite a unique way of doing this because I'm special, so here we go. I like to unscrew the four bolts on the rear housing, as well as the one on the spring tensioner. I can remove the housing, extruder gear one, the spring, and extruder gear two. Now to swap out the extruder gears. The only visible difference is the new hardened steel extruder gears are coated black. They're edgy, and they also don't take no for an answer. After I've swapped them in, it's time to turn the page onto a new chapter and remove the extruder. I carefully swap in the new hardened steel extruder. Then it's time to reassemble the tool head back inside the housing. Next, we're going to be putting the cable chain in. We start by removing the tool head housing and then removing the PCB. The cable that goes inside the cable chain needs to be slightly extended as does the PTFE tube. Once the PCB is remounted, I can slide the cable chain into place and close the rear housing. The PTFE tube slides into this rubber gasket which comes with the cable chain assembly. 
Next, the fans. I want to thank you for watching. The two fans we're mounting are the chamber fan and the control board fan. They are crucial if we want to install an enclosure. To mount the fans, I need to remove the back panel. Don't underestimate the small fan we're mounting as it cools down the entire brains of the printer. Without this fan, you'll get an overheated computer chip, the stepper motors will skip steps, and you will likely cry. Next is the chamber fan, which pulls the air from the chamber through the carbon fiber air filter and out the back of the printer. Fun fact, this air filter could potentially save your life from cancerous fumes. Before I save lives, I'm gonna have to install this ugly duct, which I printed earlier, which then the fan is mounted on top of. Thankfully, this all gets screwed to the back where it will never be seen again. Now, do you see the problem that we have here? The P1P has no holes for the air to exit the chamber. So we're gonna have to add these ourselves. So I thought I was making air holes for the fan, but this is so sharp. I actually made a cheese grater instead. On a more fun note, we're now at the exciting part of the project, the enclosure. I'm using the Vision Enclosure designed by Humebeam. As the name implies, it uses acrylic panels mounted to the 3D printed corner pieces to make a fully transparent enclosure. I absolutely love how it looks and I've also made several modifications to the design. Because we're going from a well-ventilated printer to an enclosed heated chamber, we wanna really carefully select the materials we use for the 3D printed parts. The chamber will be going upwards of 50 degrees Celsius, so we need to choose a material that won't melt or deform at those temperatures. If we take a look at the heat resistance of different materials, we can see that PLA is too close to the 50 degrees Celsius mark. While every other filament works, I do recommend using PETG as it's the easiest to print. Even though I recommend printing everything in PETG, I've decided to use nylon carbon fiber filament for the corners, which I think is much more appropriate for this video. I was able to print these on a friend's X1C. I think the surface finish is absolutely amazing. It looks like if Galaxy filament was injection molded. The only issue is there was significant stringing on the rear side of these prints, which required significant post-processing with Timmy the knife. Little did Timmy know that the nylon carbon fiber parts had expanded so much in the past month that the tabs did not fit together and needed a second round of butchering. So why did these parts expand? We discussed that after printing almost all 3D printed parts shrink, uh, and yet here they seem to have expanded, which is quite confusing. Well, this is because of nylon's second biggest problem, and that is moisture absorption. Even with the enclosure that we're building, and all the hardware upgrades that we've done thus far, we still can't print nylon reliably because of its water bending powers. Depending on the humidity, nylon can absorb more than 3% of its weight in water in under 24 hours. That's more water per kilogram than most humans drink in a day. This happens because the oxygen atoms in the nylon want to create hydrogen bonds with the water molecules in the air and become friends. Unfortunately, we don't ship the friendship because if we heat the filament with water in it, it will essentially create many gas explosions of steam as it goes through the hot end. To combat the chemical reaction, we will need to preheat the nylon before it goes into our printer. And there's a common theme here, slow cooling and slow heating. Now luckily we can get a filament dryer like this one from Sunlu. It essentially preheats the filament and evaporates the water in it. I've built a tube connector using M6 threaded inserts and two pneumatic fittings. Siri, how do you pronounce pneumatic? Pneumatic. Pneumatic. We can use this part to connect the dryer to the back of the printer later. But now that that's solved, let's continue building the enclosure. I'm going to add the M3 threaded inserts to our enclosure corner pieces. 
I'm using a pine sill soldering iron along with heat insert tips from CNC Kitchen. I have to heat the inserts to 320 degrees Celsius so they can make their way through the nylon carbon fiber. And now it's finally time to mount the enclosure frame. The expanded parts created some hole misalignment, so although I make this part of the build look easy, what you're looking at is half a day of sweat, tears, and coffee. And drumroll please for the next issue. Remember that rubber gasket that comes with the cable chain assembly from Bamboo Lab? Unfortunately, the vision enclosure doesn't account for it. Luckily, if you want to fix something quickly, you can always count on the trusty Dremel. I wasn't left with the smoothest of holes, but it works. Speaking of holes, it's now time to make the acrylic panels to seal the enclosure. Cutting the 2mm acrylic is easy using the specialty knives which carves a groove into the acrylic. After several passes, I can snap the acrylic cleanly. I also add holes using my tiny electric drill, but apart from how small it is, look how well it drills. Now that the panels are done, I can start mounting all the parts that go on the panels. Starting with the magnets. I initially used the vice press to press fit the magnets. One of the pieces I did modify was these cool 12mm acrylic handles, because what's a transparent enclosure without transparent handles? Last but not least, the hinges are mounted. Because these undergo a lot of stresses, this is the only part that makes any sense to print in nylon carbon fiber. I quickly switched to hammering the magnets in, being carefully to tap gently to not weaken the magnets. As I was test fitting the acrylic panels, I realized that the top panel isn't flush. I've also always wanted to incorporate LEDs into the printer, so I took this as a sign. Most designs I've found use risers that are way too high for my liking, it kind of looks like a skyscraper. And because I think the printer is already tall enough as it is, my goal is to make a riser that's flush with the top of the printer. I'm printing the riser in multiple pieces and using several of my favorite joining methods to make them come together. The thinner piece is joined with dowels and then the larger sections with these 3D printed butterfly pieces which are glued and press fit into place. Using this method makes it really easy to test fit before assembly. Once assembled I can mount the heat inserts with my soldering iron. I'm using this 5 volt 8 mm wide LED strip, which plugs straight into the Bamboo Lab P1P. By angling the LEDs 45 degrees, I can fit them in my 5 mm height restriction. But more importantly, it's the perfect angle to get some lovely studio lighting for future 3D printing time lapses. Soldering these was extremely time consuming because I had to first scrape off the silicone that covers the solder pads. And now I'm mounting to the printer, with the only problem being that it screws from inside the printer. Four screws took me about 20 minutes to install. Definitely not designed for assembly, uh, but it is designed to look sleek. Yeah, I'm really pleased with that. The next thing I need to think about is when I put these LEDs in, how do I turn them on and off? So we're going to need a switch. Where am I going to put the switch? Well, there's a convenient hole in the P1P here. And unfortunately, it's a bit too small. I'm going to need to make this hole bigger by one millimeter with my trusty Dremel. So I may have fucked up slightly. Uh, I now have a massive hole in the printer. I went too far to the front and found a metal bracket. The switch isn't going to fit there. And then I had to go the other way and now I've got a huge rectangle there. We have got a lovely bracket to cover my mistake like it never happened. It's not symmetrical because when I put the top panel in, you gotta make space for it. But so is life. I still think it works. Now all we have to do is wire it to the light.
There it is. Light camera action. Just need to put the acrylic panels on now that have been assembled and cut. And we will be done with the whole enclosure. So I'm looking forward to it. Right, look at that. I'm super happy with the enclosure and how it looks. I think it looks amazing, but we're not done. Believe it or not, we still have to print the nylon, see if that works. We've got the filament dryer running in the back and we've got our nylon that I've just taken out of the vacuum bag. So I'm gonna pop this in to the filament dryer and we're gonna try and get this gear printed. I have just launched the print. Fingers crossed that everything goes to plan. So we've had a problem printing. The extruder gear that I swapped in, this little guy here, when it spins, it's actually not spinning. So I do just think I've been sent a faulty gear. This one here, old one, seems absolutely fine. So I'm gonna reinstall the old gear. Yeah, after all that, okay. I've applied a lot of glue because nylon's third problem is layer adhesion got a low coefficient of friction, doesn't like to stick to anything, including itself or the bed. Right, it's printing. Let's see how it does. So initially, our first print looks good. It's not too bad. Look at that shiny backside. But unfortunately, there's some heavy warping. So we're gonna have to print this bad boy again. successfully finished printing. I do see a bit of warping, but not as much as the first one. I'm super happy. I think that was a success. We've got ourselves a shit gear, which didn't work on the first try, but nylon is often like that. It takes a lot of trial and error. I'm kind of surprised we did it in two goes, but we do have a successful print in my book. The enclosure looks absolutely sick, and we've also got a nylon gear to show for it. If you want to see more nylon in an actual project, then definitely subscribe. If you want to support me, make sure to give me some love on Patreon. I'll have the step file for this enclosure and all the parts that I've customized. I'll also include the STLs for free in the description. Anyway guys, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Until next time. So once you're done with the nylon, remember you need to put it in a vacuum sealed bag. The bags I got were way too big, but Oh well.